our speakers on this show, any speaker that is um, invited to discuss a topic here is well seasoned in that area. And today our topic for discussion is asthma and allergies. Our topic for discussion today is asthma and allergies. And our speaker for today is no other than Dr. Sandra Kwatin Owusu, who is a pediatric pulmonologist and a senior lecturer in the Department of Health, of, in the Department of Child Health, School of Medicine and Dentistry, College of Health Science, KNUST. Her research interests are in the field of childhood asthma, air pollution and its effects on the respiratory system, tuberculosis, and pneumonia. So I'd like to use this opportunity to welcome each and everyone to today's roundtable discussion and as well hand over the virtual microphone to Dr. Sandra. So Dr. Sandra, over to you, please. And you are very welcome. We are so grateful you graced this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Fiona. Um, I'm so grateful to the leadership um, for offering me this opportunity to talk to parents about um, childhood asthma. Um, thank you all for coming. And I hope our discussion today would be um, very fruitful. So I will quickly launch into the presentation. We are discussing childhood asthma and allergies. So we will look at briefly, not a textbook definition of asthma and what allergies is. And um, I guess the focus of this meeting will be to empower parents and other caregivers of children to be able to identify signs and symptoms in children that would point to asthma or other allergies that we would see. And then we would look at how the, the diagnosis is usually made. Yes, so frequently asked questions. One of them is, doctor, does he or she have asthma? And most often the next question is, will it be cured? And then sometimes to parents get worried about effects of living with asthma on the child's life. And it's also the same for allergies, where I think there's a lot of concern because our system is just opening up to the fact that allergies are also a significant health problem and that they may have long-term impact on the child or whoever is affected. So, sorry, asthma is a disease of our breathing tubes. So that's why I'm showing this image, just to show that when we talk of asthma, it's a disease of the respiratory system. It affects the breathing tubes. And mainly what having asthma does is that it causes swelling of the inner tubes of the airways. So if you look at this picture here where the arrow is, that is supposed to be your normal breathing tube, which is fairly open to allow for air to move through. And in asthma, the inner lumen of the tube is blocked or swollen, and it may be blocked with mucus. And so the fundamental problem in asthma, as we would medically see, is that there's inflammation within the tubes or the breathing pipes for the patient. And so air movement is obstructed. And that is the, and the main reason why we see a lot of children tend to have difficulty breathing because they struggle to move air and the struggle to move air is especially to move it out. So we say that it's an expiratory 
problem. The airflow limitation is in the expiratory phase of breathing. Most children with asthma would from time to time. So the other important aspect of living with asthma is that your symptoms are not present every day. And then wheezing, which is a whistling sound, which is usually heard during breathing. And then for the older children, they would complain from time to time that they have chest pain. That is as though somebody is trying to squeeze their chest. So this is also just a repetition of what I'm saying. Frequently, there's cough, there's difficulty breathing. There may be a whistling sound, chest pain. A lot of times their nose is blocked if they have allergies and they struggle to sleep because they are coughing often or they may have chest pain. So I also want to highlight here, here sorry, that for the doctor you would go to see, making a diagnosis of asthma in your child, they would take information from you, which we medically would term history taken, and then they would examine your child. And the focus of the information gathering, the parent would or the caregiver of the child would need to tell the healthcare worker about this issue of coughing, um, when did, was it first noticed? And then the pattern, remember, but I have highlighted that recurrent, so the same thing okay. another time the cough in asthma is more troublesome at night and then the wheeze a shortness of breath however the, the these symptoms may also manifest another disease condition and that's why the health worker is always important to sort of make that decision that okay what you are telling me is from asthma or it's not so we here we highlight symptoms that are worse at night or early in the morning and commonly occurring together. And then the other important information that the caregivers present every day they may resolve and reappear from time to time. Okay. So this is just a brief overview of all the information that we put together to help make a decision that your child could have asthma. So as I mentioned, even within day and night, there seem to be changes in terms of the severity of let's say the cough. So between day and night, it tends to be more, more during the night or very other days tend to make the symptoms appear more. So we look at what features in the story you are telling us that would support a diagnosis of asthma. Then we would look at, are there any identifiable triggers or any factors that make these symptoms worse? So some of the factors are in the environment, some chemicals that we call allergens, or for instance, in our bedding, is a very important allergen called dust mite. And that, for instance, is the reason why most children would be 
coughing a lot when they go into bed. So the parents will have noticed that as soon as he goes into bed, then he's coughing. And in the bedding, there may even be a blanket or things like that, that really house a lot of the dust mine. Some parents may also have noticed that anytime my child has the common cold, it takes a long time for it to go away. And then I see him coughing more, struggling to breathe. For the parents who also, or if any family member smokes, then that may also be a trigger, something that makes the symptoms worse. Okay, then step three that we would ask you that if you've ever taken your child to the emergency room, then response to administration of some medications that we call they help um, hello, Dr. Sandra. Hello, Dr. Sandra. Yes, hello. I'm so yes. sorry to interject, but it's like there's a little challenge with your my microphone um network. It keeps. I think the network. Maybe you put the video off so that we okay. check if it will be a bit stable. I hope that will be fine with you, please. That's fine. Okay, thank you. And please, um, everyone, if if you have any question along the line, please be sure to drop it in the chat box, and we'll be attending to after her delivery. Thank you so much. Okay, I hope I'm I'm being heard much better now. Yes, please, doctor. Okay, so the other important um, information that may support as diagnosing your child with asthma is your family history. So although asthma is not a 100% genetic disorder, it tends to run in families. Not always, but mostly you may find a parent with asthma. And so when a child begins to manifest symptoms that we've talked about. We are always interested in knowing whether there is any parent or even any sibling living with asthma. And then presence of other allergic conditions. So five is we would also ask you about other allergic conditions, which I will discuss a little bit more to look at, let's say allergic, right? The, the ones that affect the nose, the eyes and the skin. If so, I saw the, um, the pin. So, so this, this information yeah. help us decide that your child could possibly have asthma. So the triggers, the anything that makes a disease in a person Say, no. Hello, um, please. I think it's breaking again. Oh dear. Um, should I change my position? Maybe. Any good? Yeah, I think it's better. Okay. Oh, no. So common triggers in asthma may include dust, exercise, as I said, smoke exposure. So the child needing smoke, but being exposed to any family member who smokes, even if the parents commonly say, oh, doctor, I smoke outside. But then it, it smoke, a lot of it is deposited on the fingertips. And so just by being exposed 
the child being exposed to you, that is significant. Um, or sometimes even when you are smoking outside, your child may still be with you in the, the garden. So that is also significant. And then the last one I want to highlight is that when mostly when we move to a new site, it's the road network may not be the best. And so there's a lot of dust and that may also be a significant uh, trigger. So based on all this information that I've highlighted and also maybe from the physical examination, then we would go on to help make a diagnosis. And once we make a diagnosis that your child has asthma, the first thing we do for the family is to provide education because most parents may be anxious at that time and they may have lots of questions. So usually the doctor would provide um, an educational session where lots of your questions will be answered. And in that session, the, the doctor would tell you that, okay, because your child has asthma, we need to see him or her often. So they would offer to enroll your child in an asthma clinic. The reason that is important is that I, I also need to highlight that asthma is a chronic illness. So it's an everyday problem. It's like hypertension and like diabetes. It will not be cured, but it can be managed. And I think that is most the, 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 the message that most parents probably do not want to hear. Unfortunately, as health professionals, we are also supposed to give you the correct information. So we would not say that your asthma will be cured. However, asthma can be effectively managed and that your child can live a normal life for their whole childhood if their asthma is properly treated. So that is also the assurance that every caregiver or parent needs to have. They would also, you, you would also be given information about why you need to um, use specific medications, which I would show you. And, and in the educational session, you would also be uh, taught and plus your child on how to use medications that would help manage your child's asthma. And then you will be asked if you know of any of the triggers, the things that makes your child asthma worse. It may differ from one child to the other. So in the educational session, the triggers would come up and then you would be alerted that please look for triggers and that the presence of triggers is important to avoid them so that your child's symptoms do not get worse from time to time. And then there's also what we call other allergic conditions. So allergic conditions or what we call comorbidities are common. So asthma may not happen alone, but there may be another allergic condition that may occur with the asthma. So the doctor will look for that and then manage it. And then the other important information that the educational session is supposed to uh, give the caregivers is some basic empowerment on pre-hospital management of what we call exacerbations. In the local term, it is called attacks. So when your child has asthma, you, will, you need to be empowered. Asthma attacks commonly never happen in the hospital. They may happen in school, on the playground. They may happen at home, at church, in camp. So because of that, any parent with a child living with asthma, and sometimes the children themselves are told that you can do A, B, C when you feel that you are coughing more or you are struggling to breathe. And that is important. And then we tell you the, the red flag. So most children with asthma will, will be given what we call an asthma action plan. 
is like a red, gold, green sort of activity that shows you what to do. And now I will show a copy of that here. And so ultimately, asthma management in childhood is a partnership between the health worker and the family. Everybody is important in this partnership and that ultimates the goal. You set the goals together is that for this child who has been diagnosed with asthma, we do not want asthma to affect their life. So we call it impairment. So we want to prevent impairment. The, the impairment is the symptoms that affect the quality of life. So we left in the classroom and they refuse to join physical education session because they have asthma. So that is important. Is there a hand up? Can I please answer the questions after the presentation so that we can work with time? And then we also want the child to sleep at night. So there should be no daytime symptoms. So when the child goes to bed, they should not be awake half of the time um, because they have asthma, they, they have worsening symptoms. And then the risk, we want to prevent serious attacks. We want, there's what we call lung function, specialized devices called spirometry. Along the line in your child's treatment, you will be asked to perform spirometry. And we want your, the spirometry is an indicator of the, the, the lung performance. We want that to be as normal as possible for your child, although they have asthma. And then there's medications that are going to be prescribed for your child. We want to give you doses that prevent side effects for your child. And so we, the ultimate is that the child should grow normally and develop normally. So that is what we are aiming to do for your child. So there are two main groups of medications for asthma. We, there's what we call the controller medication. And the controller medications suppress the swelling within the airways that I mentioned. That is the ultimate treatment for asthma. So every child diagnosed with asthma, the health, the, the doctor must give controller medication or a, something to suppress the swelling. So you need to find out about which medication suppresses the swelling in the breathing tubes, and then which medication you use in emergency in case the child's asthma symptoms get worse. So that is the reliever. So there's controller that is suppressing inflammation and the reliever that is only used for emergencies. And commonly, most reliever medications come in the form of puffers, which I would show, and they tend to be blue. So the common ones in our environment is the Ventolin inhaler. So that, that is also one very important medication that your child will be given. So that I show here some of the medication. So remember that we are seeing the disease is of the breathing tubes. So our target is to reach the breathing tubes and suppress swelling. In, and that is the ultimate. If you leave this session, please carry with you this information that in managing or in treating your child with asthma, the focus should be within the airways, suppress swelling and not outside the airways and cause re bunko, um, constriction, reverse bunko constriction. Bunko constriction is just what the, the, the other medication, the emergency medication does, but that is only temporary. So for instance, it's like you have malaria, you have high temperature and you are giving paracetamol. Paracetamol is good because it will bring your child's temperature down, but it will not treat malaria. So the reliever medications are only for um, bronchial constriction in acute events when there's an emergency, but the ultimate in childhood asthma management is suppressing inflammation, swelling, 
in the airways, which is very important. And so we must all find out whether medications we are carrying with us to the house is going to suppress inflammation, it's swelling. Okay, so the device, because the disease is in the breathing tubes, we aim to deliver it to the breathing tubes. But our challenge is that because they are children, we need to devise nicer ways and easier ways to be able to deposit the medication inside the breathing tubes. So you would usually have the blue one I mentioned. This is an example of Ventolin inhaler. And that is the one we use for the emergency. And you would have something like a chamber, a tube, a bottle-like structure, a device called a spacer. And depending on your child's age, if they are, your child is four, four years, five years, they may need, they will need a spacer that comes with a mask, a nose mask. But if they are older than that, then they just need a spacer without the face mask and they will just put the device into their mouth and would apply the medication accordingly. The, the devices used in asthma management are so important. They are tailored to the age of your child. So before you leave your doctor's consultation, ensure that the device that is given to you for your child's asthma management, your child can use it. For instance, this purple device is for older children. So 10 years, mostly, uh, although the manufacturer says 12 years, sometimes 10, 11, they are, able, they, they are able to use it, but not less than that it, because children lack coordination. So when the medication is released, and when it has to be taken in, remember the airways is where we want to deposit it. So if the child is not able to coordinate well, the medication will land in the throat and that will not help. So that is why we need to give medications that would, would be easy for our child to use given their age. So the other empowerment, home management of asthma, the exacerbation is also the attack. All families need information. If you have a child with asthma at home, please keep your emergency medications within reach. Let every family member know that when also to tell you when is your red flag when you see this please reach to the nearest health facility all that information needs to come in and then sometimes the asthma action plan is also helpful which i have here so the action plan it's like a like the like for want of a better word, traffic lighting, asthma management. So green is when your child is doing well and they have no complaints. And the instruction is take your asthma medications as prescribed by your, your doctor. How many pass? So usually with this form, it is filled with, 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 between the family and the doctor. So they know. So the name, the guardian's name, the hospital, some important contact. And then what, what, what does it mean to feel good, to be able to breathe, to no struggle, no cough or whistling sound. The child is playing well, sleeping well. And that time they need to use their asthma medications as prescribed. And then the caution zone is symptoms getting worse, coughing more having pain in the chest, can't breathe normally, but it's just for a brief period, unable to play, or maybe the first sign of a cold. What you're supposed to do is that you have room to use the blue inhaler some to how many times to use it. Okay, and then the red zone is the signs that 
need you to go to the hospital immediately. So the health worker will tell you that your child cannot talk, is struggling to breathe so much that they can't even walk. They feel like they are scared. Um, you've, you've given the emergency medication a number of times and it's not helping. You immediately go to the health facility that is close to you. And I even tell parents that, please know your closest health facility. Know how many minutes it takes you to get there. If possible, even go there, enter the facility and see how they receive you. Notify them that in case my child with asthma has an attack and I come, what are the ABC steps I need to go through? Do you, for instance, have this? And so you know, if they, 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 they are not able to support you, then you aim for the next one. Because mostly when there's an emergency, there's very little time to think through all these things. So that is some important information on the asthma action plan. So I highlight again that correct devices for the right age. It is so important. It's not every device that can be used for any child. The, the devices like this, the table hailer and the disc, they are for the older children because of coordination. So as six year not be able to use it. Even a seven year old, and later you realize your child is unable to use it. So always find out from your health professional which device is appropriate for your child's age and then ensure that your technique is good. You understand well before you leave your doctor's consultation. So in the school setting, you know, as I mentioned, the spacer device, which is this, the chamber, which must go with the devices that are like this. So you see that there are difference in the devices. Please have a look at this one, which is the disc. And okay, in my previous slide, I just go back. So you see the devices are shaped differently. This one is the puffers, the, the, the wine and the blue one are the puffers. They would fit the spacer device and they may contain the emergency medication or the medication that suppresses the swelling. So that is for the younger children. And then this one, the disc, it will not work with the spacer device. That is for older children. So the spacer device, and then for instance, this brown inhaler, which is for the bringing the swelling down, would be for a younger child. Okay. Sometimes too, because the school, the, the, you are advised. So one thing I, I need to highlight is also that when your child receives a diagnosis of asthma, it is important to also talk to the child's school teachers that this diagnosis is given to my child. And this is what the doctors have said they, they should do. And so please, um, teachers, so, so and so kindly be informed. It is advisable that at least you put the emergency medication in the child's school bag together with the spacer. But because you know, children may lose the spacer devices. So, there are bottles that can also be made into like a chamber spacer. And then these ones are really cheap and you can always keep, you can have about five at a time. One to go with, if it loses it, you can always put another one so that maybe you preserve the very expensive one. Or alternatively, if you feel like you want to give this one to also the school, that's also fine. Talk to your child's teacher. You don't need to hide the, the, the diagnosis from the child's teacher. Okay, so I also want to address some misconception. So uh, over the period that um, been running the asthma clinic at Confanochi, what I've noticed is that the general perception in, in, in in <laughs> 
asthmatic patients to have asthma, take them to see the doctor. Most in Ghana, most children with asthma are diagnosed very late because their parents never take them to the health um, worker. And then a lot of homemade remedies are used to treat asthma. That does not prevent the swelling in the airways. Remember the swelling I mentioned. So please, there, there's, info, there's treatment, there's correct treatment. Then the other info, the misconception is about this. Inhaler for your child. It means emergency management of asthma. And your child doesn't even need to use it for the asthma treatment. This is just one. In fact, this is not the ultimate in asthma treatment. This is just for the emergency. The ultimate in the asthma treatment is the inhaler that, that suppresses. And please permit me to just go back to my very first slide to show you the medication that will bring the swelling here in the airways down. The, 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 we call it the corticosteroids. That is the ultimate. So having Ventolin is no death sentence at all. And I really, really want to stress that, please, it's not a death sentence. So let your child have it. But ultimately, have the other ones like, like this, this one, that in the last four weeks to so we'll ask you about daytime symptoms. How well is your child during the day? Is he coughing more? Is he struggling to breathe? And how about the night? Because we want to know that information will guide us to tell you that your child is doing well as far as living with asthma is concerned or your child is not doing well and we need to work harder at getting him to what we call well controlled. So please always have the information at hand. And if there has been the need to use the emergency medicine, then you should tell your doctor so that they will know how often you need, the child needed it. It's vital information for your doctor to tell you that, okay, now we are going up or we are coming down. So there, there are some wrongs. Okay, so I've mentioned the wrong devices. And then it's extremely important that your child has a right technique for using their asthma device. Having the right device and using it wrongly is also still the, the steroid tablet, they are not for everyday management of asthma. Sometimes you meet parents and because they are afraid to use the inhaler, this one, they rather leave the child on this, the steroids and they are giving it every day. Steroids are prescription only medication. It's only your doctor who can give it to you. So you shouldn't um, go to the counter and buy it and give it to your child every day. There are so many side effects, especially for your child. And so it is not advised that a parent would unilaterally go to the pharmacy and buy steroids and start administering them. The, the dose here is very high, as opposed to the dose in the inhaler. So what your health worker is trying to give you a much lower dose, that prevents or attacks. So don't, not, you would have so many side effects for your child, including hypertension and all that. So, and it may even affect your child's eventual height. So it is not safe to just start using oral steroids. But when your doctor prescribes it for you, you will know that they usually will prescribe it only for a short period because the doctor knows that this medication is good. Sometimes we need it when we are struggling to achieve control, but it is not for the long term every day morning and evening. 
evening for two months. Young children with asthma, oh, sorry, in Africa, um, we struggle in, in a part of the world because children are never reaching us early. And so their diagnosis is delayed. And even when we make the diagnosis, most families struggle to accept the diagnosis. And so asthma is poorly treated. Of course, we are appreciate that sometimes the cost of the medication is also a, a challenge. And I think um, there's so much being done in behind the scenes to make asthma medications more affordable, especially to children. A coughing, wheezing, what well, that is the whistling sound, shortness of breath, occur to, occurring together in a repetitive fashion may signal asthma. Then when your child's asthma diagnosis is made, education will be offered to you and on how to live with asthma long term. We want lung health to be preserved for your child. And then the goal in asthma management is the inhaled corticosteroid. This one, this is the goal in asthma management. So your child with asthma diagnosis cannot go home with the goal. So ask your daughter, your doctor about the goal in asthma management because that is what suppresses the swelling in the airways. And at every visit, be willing to give the right information so that your doctor will know whether to adjust your treatment. And also try to show your doctor whether you can, your child is able to use the medications well. So um, yeah, asthma can be effectively managed. I will try and touch on the allergies, I don't. Yeah, overreactions of the our immune system is like our Ministry of Defense for the body. So um, they are always ready, you know, like the army is ready to defend Ghana anytime there's any attack. So they are on the land, they are on the sea, and they are in the air too. So the body also has its own defense mechanism. But sometimes you know that there may be somebody who is not really uh, to harm us. Who is passing through? And then the soldiers may usually represent. So the body's immune system, they, they, they respond too much to what ideally should be a, a, an innocuous agent. And then they begin to manifest, the body will manifest symptoms. Some of it is mild, some of it is life threatening. So you would come across terms like, allergy and I think my simple definition of allergy is body's defense gone wrong but before we get before allergy what it is is that we we say somebody is hypersensitive because their body produces symptoms and signs that follow exposure to specific chemicals that in otherwise in an otherwise normal person, that those symptoms will not happen. So a typical example is, for instance, uh, if you spray red inside your room, you know, one of your children may cough and cough and cough. Ideally, all the children will cough briefly and then step out and they are fine. But the one child who will cough and cough and cough and the whole evening is so uncomfortable is the one who has hypersensitivity. So their body just mounts a very big attack to something that is really small, and that is the basis. So allergen is like a chemical that causes the allergic diseases. And then we may also have heard of the term atopy. So it is like your personal or familial tendency in childhood to become like your body produces a response to um, allergies. Then the response in not the process of allergy have just made it to be we all of us when we are born 
at the beginning in, in our neonatal period, when we are just like less than one month old, um, we set the stage for becoming allergic or otherwise. And we know that inside the neonate, the, the, the baby's guts, the, 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 the feeding system is where this whole thing begins. And there's information to support the fact that starting off with breast milk is usually better at preventing allergies later in life. So that is something that we know. However, in some people, so basically becoming allergic or otherwise in a very brief terminology, this is really basic. And so I hope we don't really stretch it beyond what I'm trying to um, explain that some factors that will work to be able to sort of switch off allergy is one, um, your, your genes, your, your system, and then your encounters. And we hear the chemicals you encounter first in your in the baby's the feeding tubes, the, the, the intestine. We prefer that it is breast milk because that one sort of enhances an allergy switch off. And the reverse, we see that they tend to have more allergies, but it's not a straightforward breastfed, so never allergies or not breastfed, so allergies. But we believe that a lot of that and many other factors contribute to developing allergies later in life. How are allergies diagnosed? So depending on the information you give your doctor, they will be able to tell you. And then some questions they will ask you about whether there's anybody with any allergy test. That is one of the basic allergy tests that are done to quickly tell us that your child is allergic to dust mites and cats and all that. And I think it's becoming increasingly available in a part of the world. So skin break tests, they are standardized, they give information, they can quickly inform, help your doctor inform you about what to avoid yeah, and what not to avoid. For instance, the cat allergy, the dog allergy and all that. And so, and the treatment will be based on exactly what your child is manifesting. And um, so allergic rhinitis, more, the, the common allergies that would, come along with asthma. One of them is called allergic rhinitis. Allergic rhinitis is, is something that affects the nose. It's an allergy of the nose. And um, it, it, it can be really night may exist for a long time before asthma becomes officially diagnosed. So how do you know your child has allergic rhinitis? So their nose is like swelling. Remember the swelling in the tubes, in the breathing tubes? It's the same swelling in the nose. So basically allergies go with swelling or inflammation. So in the nose, there's swelling. And so they always struggle to breathe. So the child has it's like they, every day they have a cold. They say their nose is itching. They sneeze a lot in the morning. They are congested. They sometimes can't even smell. And their symptoms, as I said, worse in the morning or in the night when they are sleeping. And when they are complaining of the nasal symptoms, they may also have eye symptoms occurring with it. So how can it be helped? Education is provided. It can be effectively treated. Then the skin also can have allergies. So what we call eczema, you would see that there are different types. Usually when it is very severe, you need to have the, the skin doctors involved. But from our end, we look for basic things like um, itching, dryness of the skin, and for the babies, you see that their face may really be dry. And whilst they are still babies, you find they find a way to often scratch the face right from around age three months. And then the area around the neck, the skin of the neck may be different texture. 
um, um, color compared to the rest of it. So it falls onto itself. So we call it the flexes. So those are the areas that are important to look out for. Okay. Um, and eczema too can be treated. So still education. In eczema, skin hygiene is so important, especially if the child has been scratching a lot and there's, there are areas, they, there are breaks in the skin, then skin hygiene. So frequently bathing the child and applying lots and lots of what we call emollients will help. The soap for the bathing must really be basic. So I don't want to go into very detail, but something simple, no fancy soaps. So like a typical life boy, guardian or sunlight should even be fine. Bland soaps are fine for bathing the child. And the the the, the emollient, the, the like the cream for the skin. Some don't dry them completely before you apply it so because your skin is responding very much. But the other information, I think your doctor should be able to talk to you about it. It can also be treated. You start off with the the emollients but in some cases they may need um, steroids to add and then there's also the allergic disease of the eye where the, the the child's eye becomes red or thin so that is also important to know and mostly following specific triggers okay so always the treatment will start by removing what is the offending agent or what we call the trigger and then there may be the need to uh, give specific agents. So this one to you need your doctor to be involved. Then I want to also lastly mention. Yeah. So basically, it's it is it is seen among children who snore, but it's not every child who snores who has obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is seen in children who snore plus struggle to sleep. So we call it, um, the, the, their sleep is interrupted so often. So in our term, we call it sleep fragmentation. It's like their sleep is broken down into pieces. It's not a continuous peaceful sleep. They wake up because they are unable to breathe. Or you, the parents may even have noticed that your child is unable to breathe so you may have um up and sort of tell them to breathe so that is important so if your child with asthma has snoring plus inability to sleep continuously and when you have noted him not breathing it's important because it can cause a um, growth impairment sometimes the children in the morning when they wake up then now they are sleepy because they didn't sleep well at night and it can impair concentration in school and even make the child look like they are so hyperactive, but it may just be because they are not sleeping well at night. So basically, that is all I have to talk about. I want to encourage all of us to make childhood asthma a health priority. Asthma in childhood can be effectively managed, but we must seek help for the child early enough. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing from here. Fiona, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandra. Wow, that was such a lovely presentation. That was so great. Okay, so at this juncture, we'll would be taking us through question time. So please, Dr. Samira, kindly take us through. Thank you so much. Hello, Dr. Samira. Hello, please, can can I be heard, Mr. Goldfred? Yes. Okay. In the meantime, I think, shall we help or we still Okay. Wait? Yes, yeah. please. So then I think we'll just start with the hands that are up. So I see Wisdom Agbozi. Mr. Wisdom Adboji, please forgive me if I'm not getting the name right. So please, you can unmute and ask your question.
Hello, Mr. Wisdom. Are you ready yeah, to hello. ask your question, please? Oh, oh sorry. Hi, Fiona. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hello. I couldn't unmute okay. myself, so I could I nobody could hear me. Thank you, you very camera. much. Oh, welcome. welcome. Yes, yes. I, I was unable to unmute yeah, myself earlier. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Kwatin. That was a very lovely presentation. I learned so much. So um we'll go through the questions here. So I think the first question here is from Dr. Yanieta, Yanieta Okai. She says, can you please throw some light on the RAST test? How useful is it to diagnose allergies? Okay, uh, yes. So I wanted to highlight that some of the tests, they can be, it is, it is useful, but usually what I, I advise is that please don't just go to the lab and run a long test of uh, what we call allergic tests and come and give to your doctor that I think my child has allergies, so check. One, we want you to save money. And then two, we want to target the right thing. So most of these tests are helpful, but it must be put in context. So first speak to your healthcare professional, know what exactly your child has, and then you can... Um, uh, uh, decide that whether you should take blood sample to run. So that those are the IgE related tests that we run of blood. But the other simpler one that I mentioned was a skin prick test, which usually would be like a simple recommendation that I would make if it is available for children above three years. That could be a quick one to decide that, okay, this is what the child is allergic to. And if that does not work, then you may now go to steps higher. So they are all useful, but then it must be sort of in a stepwise fashion. Yeah, thank you. Over to you, Dr. Samira. Okay, I think we lost her again. Hello? Okay, so please, um, in the meantime, I think we can take the hands that are up. So I see Animle Abigail. Please, you can unmute and ask your question. Hello. Mm -hmm. Can I be heard, please? Okay. You know, yeah. Yeah, fine. Yeah, no, we can hear you. I think it's difficult to unmute. Okay. So I, I was also struggling. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I would have our technician look into mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So if if you're finding it difficult to unmute yourself, just type the question in and then I'll read it out. So I'll read the next question that's on the list here. Um, I think Nanajiman Ababio is asking if um. He yeah. says, do you start all asthmatics on inhaled corticosteroids and how long must they be on it? Okay, so by international guidelines now, when a child is formally diagnosed with asthma, they must be initiated on some form of inhaled corticosteroid. Um, the frequency will depend on the asthma severity. So that information would have to be in consultation with the doctor. So yes, the first question is yes. All children with a formal diagnosis of asthma need inhaled corticosteroid. However, how often it needs to be given would depend on the severity and the health worker would talk to you about that. How long should your child with asthma be on inhaled corticosteroid? That also would need to be answered by the health worker. Some children do so well that over the period, they will need we step them down and down and down. But I think in the in the active period of childhood, I don't stop inhaled corticosteroid. We bring it down. Sometimes some children are even on it, let's say only three, three doses a week. So alternate day doses, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that is fine. So maybe this forum will not allow us enough time, but I want to encourage all parents, lung growth is not complete at best. A lot of lung growth happens 
all the way up to adolescence. And so when you, you, you prevent your child from going on treatment for asthma because you are afraid to give inhaled corticosteroid, you are not helping your child. What you are doing to your child is that you are causing their lung growth to be restricted. And most of these children by age 18, they, 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 they are lung growth, we, there's something we call plateau. Usually plateau should happen at age 25, but for most children whose asthma is poorly treated, they plateau at age 18, and they now tend to decelerate dis in terms of their lung function. So that is why we want to encourage parents, please don't, don't, don't struggle to, to in, keep your child on inhaled corticosteroid, but it's low doses. And sometimes even three doses a week is fine, better than nothing. That because you are not helping your child's lung to grow well. Yeah. So they need steroids, but the stopping would, would in, in, in childhood up to, until 12 years, I, I won't encourage it. I will encourage some low doses few times a week, if truly the child has asthma. Yeah. Thank you okay. very much, Dr. Kwating. So um, the next one I see here from Elam. Elam says, please, does a color of the inhaler matter? That's a Venulin inhaler. Yes, the color matters. So I said by convention, blue is only for emergencies. If your child has been diagnosed with asthma, you must always leave your doctor's consulting room with two inhalers, the blue inhaler, which only for emergency, and it, the other inhaler may be of a different color, depending on the manufacturer. It can be brown commonly, it may be orange in color, it may be wine in color. So the, the ones that bring the swelling down, remember we said the swelling of the tubes must go down, are the inhaled corticosteroids. And for that, the color will differ. But by convention, you need two groups of inhalers, one that brings the swelling down and the other that is only for emergencies, okay, which would commonly be a blue inhaler. That's the ventolin. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I see another question here. So please, at what age is asthma diagnosed in children? That's from Yasewa. Okay, so that, that is a, asthma can be diagnosed at any age for a child, if it's a health professional who is seeing the child. However, in the preschool age, most of the time that we know we mentioned cough and wheezing, the whistling in the sound. Wheezing is not only because of asthma. Wheezing can be from other disease condition. So that is where the confusion is, that when you have a three-year-old who's just started daycare, who has a common cold and comes to you with a whistling sound in the chest, is that asthma? That may not necessarily be asthma. So it does not mean asthma cannot be diagnosed. Any health professional would be able to, based on what you are telling them, Remember, I said the golden words in asthma is recurrence, repetitive episode. So when the wheeze happens, goes and comes, and goes and comes often, responds to treatment in the emergency room, then your health worker may be able to, based on that, say your child has asthma. It doesn't really matter the age. However, when they are one year and two years and they are wheezing, we also look at, is this child going well? What else is in the family? And in that age, there may be other major disease conditions that can also look like asthma. So that's, that's all that is a health worker's work to be able to decide, okay, this wheeze and, and cough is from an infection, a major infection, but this wheeze and cough is from asthma. So although the diagnosis can be made, you need a little bit of troubleshooting, stepwise a information telling, examining your child. Sometimes you may have to go and come back two or three times. So you need to also be patient with your health worker. And I want to encourage parents, please don't do doctor shopping. Don't keep going to facility A, B, C, D, just with one, because then you're always having to retell your story. Stay with one doctor. If you go and you do not get the desired result, please go back and tell him or her that, doctor, I came to you with so-so and so, but my child has not improved. What shall we do? Then maybe the doctor will say, okay, now this step is the next, or that step is the next, or we are referring you to a higher level of care 
You know, all those needs to be done rather than you always going to start afresh and then telling your story again. It's like going around in circles. Sometimes it doesn't help. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwating. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, there's a question here from B. B is asking if um, trachea. Take four morning for you. Asthma. Oh, okay. Can, sorry, can I pronounce it for you, please? Fine. Um, Trachea Malaysia. Um, I'm from the UK, so I've learned a lot from your presentation, which is really, really good. Um, I, my child was first diagnosed with asthma this year, but we was on the blue inhaler quite a while. But now he's um, he hasn't asked for his pump for lately, so they've told me to stop until he needs it again. But I think mostly it will happen in winter time. Um, he has a condition called trachea um, I haven't, it's quite rare. So what they've told me is a narrow windpipe. I yes. don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. So it's a narrow windpipe and that's what they've told me in the UK. They don't know if he causes asthma. They don't know. They stopped him from going to ENT because obviously his breathing is now okay. He does know at night when he's um, really deep sleep. Um, in the UK, we're in one bedroom with the with um, his brother and me. So um, that's what they've told us. And I've booked for priority on medical housing, but they rejected it because there's not enough evidence. Yeah. So my question is, does trachomalacia cause asthma? Because I have no idea. I've actually learned a lot from your presentation, especially uh, with my child being the first one in our family to have asthma. Yes, so it can happen that there's no other person. So it can skip generation. So there may have been some of your great grandparents who had asthma and now for a long, for some generations, nobody, and then your child. Mm -hmm. Or it can be like what we say, like a, a spontaneous, de novo. So nobody, but your child. So remember is your genes and the environment. So the mm -hmm. two come together. And that is why sometimes for a particular child, depending on their genetic makeup, their genes, and then the mm -hmm. environment that you, your child is in, when they come mm -hmm. to then the child may or may not show asthma. So that is what it is. But there may be no family member with asthma and your child could still have asthma. So mm -hmm. the narrow windpipe, is, it doesn't cause asthma. That is, that is something that is, uh, your child is born with. So it is okay. con a congenital. Uh, it doesn't cause asthma. And you see that it's improving because as your child is growing, the, the, the windpipe is becoming stronger. So it doesn't collapse so easily on itself. So that is mm -hmm. why the child is getting better. And that's why they say you don't need to see the ENTs again. So we will just stay mm -hmm. with that. So it's a separate condition and asthma is a separate condition. But the two of oh, them okay. can still be present in one person. Mm, okay, never knew that. And secondly, my other child has allergies. So I have one child that has allergies to um, what's the allergy? Milk and sesame. And I heard you said about the RSAT test and the skin prick. Um, our one got cancelled this week, so he was supposed to have another one supervised feeding, but it got cancelled. Um, I have another question for you because my first, my, the child I mentioned with the asthma. He's got a brown and a blue inhaler, but in school, they don't really give it to him. They're supposed to give it to him before PE. I've told the teachers about it, but because he rarely asks for it, they don't give it to him. Is that, um, he's supposed to have it, I think, twice? Yeah, twice every day and every morning. So I know it's a lot of work for the teachers. Yeah. Um, your child is also now probably growing so you can you can empower your child i think that the, i have grown to understand how much we can empower the children with the right information mm -hmm. to the extent that they can even remind the parents that mommy i need to take this daddy i need to take this and so you you talk to your child once they understand as they are growing i think the one way is the child himself or herself can also mm -hmm. use before they go for PE, because I'm very yeah. passionate about the child must go for PE. Even if they cannot, like they say, they are not the striker or the whatever, they can mm -hmm. be, they must be on the field. No child should be left in the classroom 
when PE is happening because they have asthma. That's, that's even is a form of like, I think it's like, I, I dare stretch it to stigmatization. So mm -hmm. then everybody's going to say, this is the one with asthma who is not able to go for PE. But even if they are standing on the park as a cheerleader, that's also fine. You understand. So yeah. whatever is within the child's ability is what we recommend. Not that the child should be running and doing what they are able to do, but just being with their classmates wherever they are is okay. okay. But also speak to the teachers. You you can have a had to like a simple talk to them again, remind them and plead with okay. them. Okay, um, I think that was my other. I think my other question was about allergies with, and I would think I have allergies to nut, but my child has allergies to milk and sesame. But here in the UK, they I don't know if you're aware of it. They have strikes, so um, I know with my one of my my child likes eating things that he's not allowed to eat, but he won't have a reaction until um maybe either later on in that day, or maybe the next day. And then he was then that the next day you can't do what you want to do because you have to monitor him, give him um, I don't know, searches in operating so that everything is fine with his bowels and stuff like that. So um I think my question was um, I don't know how you work in Ghana about the R test, but we have a skin prick test and then we also have a blood test that they do, and then we also have um supervised feeds. Um my question is that do you have that in Ghana as well? Okay, so we, I think we, we, we're still setting up. So now there's an allergy society of Ghana. I know there's mm -hmm. the, about two allergologists in training. So we are getting there. We are, we are just getting there. I, it's coming up very soon. So I am not an allergologist. I'm a pulmonologist, but there's an allergologist who's just coming on the block. And I'm, I know she's going to be doing the food allergy testing and all the other questions to help okay. So, okay. yeah okay thank you for that okay thank you for answering my questions i'll let somebody ask questions okay. thank you so much thank you thank, thank, you, you, thank you very much dr sandra please if you don't mind you could turn your video on that's if it's okay with you yeah let me see let me just try and move into okay. a good okay. So while you are turning on your video, um, so um, there's this question here. Hello, doctor. My child was recently diagnosed, but prior to that, any time we had an attack, the doctors asked that we run some labs and the BBC was always high. That's being put on antibiotics. My question is, is the use of the antibiotics safe or a remedy? Okay. So, you know, because it's a doctor who saw your child, maybe they, based on the information you gave the doctor, they concluded that your child had an infection. So that's why your child needed the antibiotics. Um, I, I, I think I'm, I cannot say yes or no, because it, once the health professional sees your child and decide, um, they may need it. However, you see, in the early stages of growth, a lot of infections, but then some of them commonly are viral. I'm sure your child has just started uh, daycare. So the, the stage of daycare is lots and lots of viral infections, some of which may take a long time to clear and later become superimposed with bacteria infection. So maybe one or two prescriptions of antibiotics based on what your doctor thinks may be necessary. However, what I also don't want to encourage us is that because your doctor prescribed antibiotic A, don't go to the pharmacy repeatedly with a prescription form and say, okay, give me this because this is what the child had the last time and the doctors gave A, B, C. Repeated doses of antibiotics are not healthy. And so I would encourage you not to do that. Um, maybe your, your doctors are still trying to decide clearly whether your child has allergies or they have um, infections only. So I think it's the feedback that is so important sometimes for us to be able to make the decision. I hope your question is answered. Okay, maybe... Thank yeah. you very much. So there are a few hands up. Um, Jacob Eshen, Junior. Okay, Dr. Samira, there's also, okay, maybe you come Hello, back. Hello, good evening. 
Yes. Hello. Good evening. Yes. Yes. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please speak up. Hello. Good evening. Yes, we can hear you, Mr. Shen. Hello. Good evening. It's okay. Yes. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, very good presentation. Uh, my submission is that Noni is very good for asthmatic condition. So uh, I would advise that we all incorporate noni juice regiment into the management of asthmatic um, childhood asthma. Uh, you give the child from the research, you can give five ml noni. You can add it to the uh, drinking water of the child. You take the water bottle, measure the five ml of noni into it, and add the, the drinking water. So he should be sipping it as uh, he takes water in the course of the day as he goes to school and put it in the school bag. So he'll be sipping it, and it helps very well noni. Noni has been proven to be very good for asthmatic uh, uh, patients for that matter. Two, I would like to comment on the physical activity of the asthmatic patient. Listen, we have PE masters, professional PE masters in the school, and they handle such things very well. Uh, there are certain schools that they don't have the PE masters. That is why any ordinary, ordinary people are saying they are sports masters. There's a difference between a sports master and a PE master. So acts of the PE master, who, has, uh, who is well trained, who will be able to handle all this field because the children from home or from hospital, the school is the next, they spend eight hours in the school. So the PE master is professionally trained to handle all this. I can remember when I was teaching at Aquinas Secondary School, my basketball captain was an epileptic patient. Can you believe it? An epileptic patient being the captain of the school basketball team. And I handled him and he never had episode. So we finished and we won the Greater Accra region. So you need a highly skilled PE master to be able to handle such things. So when you go to a school, request to speak to the PE master, not just the, uh, what do you call it, the sports master or the one who is training them, the trainer. And that will help because every child must participate in physical activity. That rather improves the health of the child in whatever medication, whatever condition that the person is doing, is having. So please, for the fact that the child is asthmatic, doesn't mean that you should stay, at, uh, stay in class and stay off uh, physical activities. If the person is well-trained, you have what they call the individualized uh, physical activity plan for each health condition of the child. Thank you very much, bye. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Ishan. Um, Dr. Sadra Kwatim, please, would you like to comment on what he just said about noni juice. <laughs> you know, um, unfortunately, I haven't worked with that. So it will be difficult for me to comment on it at the moment. Maybe he has experience with it, but and because I don't have experience with it, I'll struggle to comment on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello. Okay. Um, hello, Dr. Samira. Sorry to cut in. I yes. I'd like to get out there and please to our lovely audience, let's all try to at least use maybe two minutes or one minute to um, ask our questions, please. Thank you so much. And actually, we we'll actually prefer that you type it so that we can read it and then we'll, the world will read it along. Yes, that's true. True. Yeah. True. So Thank please you so type much. your questions, please. Thank you very much. So someone is asking if the skin prick, skin prick test can be done here in Ghana. And that, yeah. Yes, they can be done here. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hello. So. It must be by the health professional. Please don't go outside and say, I've done skin prick. I'm bringing you to you, daughter, to interview. Please don't let me. Rather, doctor, see your child. Okay. So, someone, let me read this one here. My children have not been diagnosed with asthma, but based on my family history and the fact that I have one myself as a parent, I concluded that the breathing issues my child has is asthma. <laughs> he says, please forgive me. 
Um, please, when do I use a ventolin inhaler or Simbicot inhaler? Okay, please. They, they need a formal diagnosis. You still need to take them to a health professional. So the doctor who is seeing you, ask them. They may also have a pediatrician or, I mean, a doctor who sees children in the same facility or somewhere close by. It is still very important that they have a formal diagnosis. So asthma management in children is not just about starting Ventolin inhaler or Symbicot. There's more to it than that. And that is why you need a doctor. Uh, if you have a pediatrician, that would be fair. That would be super to, to be involved in the child's management. So there are so many day-to-day issues that need to be handled mm -hmm. and so I would encourage you to please get a formal diagnosis for them once you have a family history I'm sure if you speak to your doctors they will be able to tell you whether it's truly mm -hmm. asthma your children are manifesting I don't even know the ages of your children so we, we unfortunately cannot recommend that they start using A or B please speak to your doctor and then we can take it from there um, Okay. Thank you, Dr. Quartin. So in addition to that, there are a number of questions, there are a number of questions in the chat about how often you should use the inhaler. Um, I think the same answer applies. It's better you talk to your doctor so that they can properly assess and tell you how often you should use the inhaler. There are about three questions on that, so I wouldn't read those ones out. Um, so there's one here about if the knowledge use is evidence-based, like Dr. Quartin says, she has no experience on with it. She hasn't used it before, and so she cannot really say. Oh, Dr. Quartin, do you want yes. to add anything to that? Yes, I haven't used it. So unfortunately, I cannot comment. You know, in um, orthodox medicine, um, for you to be able to say this is evidence-based, it must have gone through um, like clinical trials and all that too. That's why, unfortunately, I, I cannot comment on it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And there's another one from Animale Abigail. Please, is there any first aid for asthma? Example, if I should meet a child in an asthmatic attack, is there anything I can do immediately to help the child? Yeah, if a child has asthmatic attack, the, 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 supposing the child is able to speak and is an older child, they may have their inhaler with them. If the child is unable to speak, they don't have anything with them and they found out for the first time that they are struggling to breathe. Remove all tight clothing, calm the child down, but aim to take them to the nearest health facility as quickly as possible. You know, asthma is exacerbation. Sometimes it can be mild, but other times it can be so catastrophic that you, you don't want to, especially for one without a formal diagnosis, um, delay. So the first aid for asthma in the child who does not have a pre-existing diagnosis, calm them down. It's supposing it happens in the school, please go to the nearest health facility. That's why I'm saying that for each school that has children, you should know your emergency processes. You should know where you get help from. If for, it may take you five minutes to get to the nearest health facility. Go there ahead of time, speak to whoever, sort of have an emergency plan. Because if any school that has about 100 children, I'm sure about given the prevalence of asthma in Ghana now, about 10 of those children ages between six, seven, up to 14 years would have asthma. So you should know your health facility. If you're a parent, your child is beginning to have breathing problems. Your first aid is know where you get help from. But mostly we, we, we sort of sometimes delay and say, okay, let's check it. Let's see. When it comes to breathing, you may not always have a lot of time. So your first aid is if your doctor has shown you that, okay, use this blue inhaler for your child this way, number of times, all that is the health worker's duty to, to tell you. So you need your doctor to be involved and they will give you your emergency plan. But otherwise, if you find your child struggling to breathe and all that, your first point of call is the nearest health facility. Go as fast as you can there. That would help the child. So no staying at home and checking and giving homemade remedies to try to see how things would go. Because sometimes things could go really bad and we don't want that. Yes. Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwating. Okay. Question has been very well answered. And 
So um, for Millicent Aqua says, my child has asthma and is always having itchy eyes and itchy sore, itchy sore throat. How do I help her? Does that all also trigger asthma? Um, so yes, it could. You know, the triggers, they are different. So for a particular child, you know, some of any item that has a bit of a strong smell could potentially be a trigger for a particular child. So having it, you know, when they enter the bathroom in the morning, the reason they are coughing a lot is the smell of the soups and the other detergents that are there. So yes, it could be that it is the reason why your child is coughing a lot more. So maybe redraw it, but you need to go to the health worker and you need to cost check with them that given ABC that my child has, could it be asthma? Let them check you. If you don't have an answer, please go back to the doctor and tell doctor, when I came to you the last time, I wasn't satisfied with the answer. What do we do then? Then maybe the doctor would say, let's move you to the next level of care or something like that. Okay. I hope I captured everything about the question. Yes, please. I think there are a few other questions about whether dairy can trigger it. I think it's I think it falls in line with this question too. Like different people have different triggers. So mm -hmm. unless Dr. Quartin wants to add something else. Yes. So I think there was a question about dairy. I think yes. So it mm -hmm. could be a trigger. Okay. And um, so Nutifa Fabuama says, please, I hear recurrent tonsillitis could be a sign of cancer until <laughs> it's too late. This is the situation with my son. Do I have to be worried? What test can I certain it's not? Okay, so please, you need to see the doctor urgently so that the doctors check your child. It will be better if you can see a pediatrician as soon as practical. Then they will look at the tonsil and tell you what they think about it. And if your child needs to go to a next level of care doctor, so every tonsil is different from the other. And so we cannot say a yes or no unfortunately. We need to see the doctor immediately. So please go to the help to decide that the tonsillitis is it, what is it? Because each of them may be peculiar. Okay. okay. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Okay. So, hi, can you please address the risk involved in attempting to give a child? in an exacerbation, something to drink, especially in cases that have been officially diagnosed. A child who is struggling to breathe, I want to, I want to attempt to give them something to drink. You see, breathing and swallowing they, 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 and that speaking, these three events are so interrelated that um, one something could go wrong when the one is struggling. So, Please, if, if your child is struggling to breathe, even outside asthma, I think the best is please go to the nearest health facility as soon as possible. So breathing is the airways, unfortunately, the, in children can easily get compromised. So that is the why we really need to always quickly seek help for them and not decide of less sleep when we wake up tomorrow. Sometimes the one hour can make a big difference. So please seek help as quickly as possible. Um, Dr. Samira, there was a question about at what age can inhalers be used? And I saw it two, something about two years. I, I thought I could answer okay, that. Okay. I haven't actually seen that question yet, but go ahead. So um, please, the health worker who makes the diagnosis of asthma in your child would usually guide you as to which medications are appropriate for their age. Um, I'm sure they would also have looked at what the asthma lookalikes and would have ticked all of them out of the box for the two-year-old. Because the two-year-old who has episodes of cough, difficulty breathing and wheezing, the, the doctor would go through some ticks with you so that they know that, okay, it's not... A is not B, there are about so many other conditions. Once that is done and treatment needs to start, usually we appreciate that the two-year-old will struggle to use uh, the regular asthma devices. But there are other methods that the health worker can use to deposit 
the steroid in the child's lung. So please go back to your, your child's doctor. Mm -hmm. They will be able to tell you what to do. There are yeah. other medications. No. We can use yeah. other devices to be able to deposit the medication into the lungs. So there's help for every child based on their age and based on their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question from Dr. Oseyebwa about blood test. Um, let me see. Let, let me look for that. While you are, what I'm looking for it, um, there's one that maybe you will take that. Um, I was asked to give my daughter who has asthma viscop S continuously within this rainy season to prevent her from having an asthmatic attack. Can you please share your thoughts on this? I think for those who don't know viscop F, it's a cough syrup that has some amount of salbutamol in it, oh. which is a safe ingredient in um, Ventolin. So that's a question. Yeah, so, but you see, um, if your child has a formal diagnosis of asthma, you, you should have left your doctor consulting room with the two medications we talked about. You must have your Ventolin inhaler, and then you must have the other inhaler that brings the swelling down. Now, I don't know why Biscoff F came up, but I'm thinking that if your child has asthma, this is a crucial time to ensure that they are on the asthma medication, the one that brings the swelling down. I won't miss any dose during this cold season. So Sabutamol alone does not treat asthma. Remember what I said that the swelling within the airways is the ultimate we want to bring down. So I'm sure your doctor has spoken to you about taking the controllers this is the time to be up on it. This is the time to do it without forgetting morning and evening every time to bring the swelling down. If your swelling goes down, then you, you don't have an issue. When you're, your, your child will not even cough that often. And so you may not. Oral salbutamol, the syrup salbutamol and the tap salbutamol. Current asthma guidelines do not recommend them unless for very challenging reasons. So, um, I, I, I think you need to discuss again with, with your doctor and sort of understand, you know, there may have, something may have happened, but cough mistress, the sabutamol they contain, we don't want to use that as the way to manage asthma. The ultimate in managing asthma is to bring the swelling down. I said that your child has malaria. Yes, they can take paracetamol, but if you don't take anti-malarials, then you haven't started treating the malaria. So, Please, Sabutamo, our focus on childhood asthma management should not be on giving Sabutamo, not even the Ventolin inhaler. What your child should use every day is the one that brings the swelling down. When you give your child Viscoff every time, you are targeting the outside of the airways. That is not where the problem is. The problem of asthma is within the airways. And so you must give something that brings the swelling in the airways down. That is the way you can win. So maybe you need to have the discussion again. I, I don't know the context in which the Viscoff came up, but please, I would really want to advise that use the inhaled corticosteroid. That is the gold in asthma management. Mm -hmm. And that can keep your child symptom free, even during this period. They will have very little need for salbutamol. The ultimate management of asthma is to use your controllers so well that the swelling in the tubes comes down so that there's very little need for the salbutamol. Mm -hmm. The fear in the Ghanaian society about asthma, that asthma kills and all that is because our focus, we have focused the wrong way. Our focus has been on using salbutamol, salbutamol, whether syrup, tablets, or inhaler. That is not the ultimate in asthma management. Mm -hmm. The ultimate in asthma management is to give inhaled steroid, bring the swelling in the airways down, then your child will be fine then we can all allay our fears about what asthma is. If we do that, there'll be very few poor outcomes. Yeah, thank you. I hope I've said it well enough. Because yes, I, we have. Thank you, it. Dr. Kowating. So before I continue the questions, Dr. Marvel is giving us a reminder. If you do not have a pediatrician, please come over to Mission Pediatrics. There is a pediatrician available from Monday to Saturday. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, she was a, so another one from Dr. Mabel. She says, Dr. Kwating, when can my child stop taking the maintenance steroid inhalers? 
Okay, so in, I said that up to age 12, we aim to give as few doses as possible, but I don't want to redraw it completely because the lungs are still actively growing. We want the lungs to achieve a certain max. We want what we call the plateau period to happen around age 25 and not age 18. So the plateau period is where you are like Usain Bolt, where you can do a lot with your lungs. But you can get there if you still help your child by maintaining them. And it can be few doses. I'm not talking about giving so many doses. It can be just even weekend doses. But don't withdraw it before age 12 because the risk of not ultimate lung development happening for your child is being proven. There's lots of long-term data. The Tuscan studies have shown us a lot of studies from Europe and Australia shown us that there's still a lot of lung growth happening up until age 12. And that even for children with chronic conditions like asthma, if you are able to maintain them well on treatment, few doses can prevent them from having an abrupt stop of lung growth, which makes their, like their period of the same boat long enough, not short. Because then by age 25, your child cannot even run for five minutes and they are so tired. So that's why in childhood now, the focus is few doses a week, very little, I mean, in terms of the dose, but don't redraw it because most of them don't do well at all when you redraw complete. But if it's just Saturday and Sunday even, when the family is, is not rushing and you just give it morning doses, so long as there's a trickle of steroids going in, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And that will not affect the child's growth. It will not affect the child's height. And it does not give any side effects whatsoever if used correctly. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So um, Michelle Akondo has a, like a sort of a follow-up question to that. She says, so if the asthma has been controlled for over a year and then the child gets an attack, can she still be put on inhaled corticosteroids? Yes. So once the, so you see that we said that you achieve control. It's a cycle. So once you achieve control, you keep them on the lowest dose that pre prevents them from having symptoms. But if you have achieved control and the child has a breakthrough, um, exacerbation, then you have to start all over again and then still achieve control and start all over again. So at that time, the steroids will need to be reintroduced, maybe at a slightly higher dose, and then you go step by step, achieve control again. So the cyclical thing, it's not stationary at all, it's not static at all. It's the cyclic that it, it continues, yes. So Elikem says, Dr. Kwatin, can spirometry be negative in children with recurrent episodes of wheezing with good, with good bronchodilator response? Child is, in question is eight years. What will be the next step, please? Thank you. Spirometry, for, even for a child with a, posit a positive diagnosis of asthma, spirometry can be negative. So in that case, usually it's recommended to repeat one or two more times. And um, there, are, there are other tests that we, we need to do. But then even if the spirometry is negative, the curve that the child made following the spirometry will be able to tell us that your child has an obstructive <laughs> illness. But the curve, the way, the pattern of the curve that your child makes when they blow into the spirometer would be able to tell us that this child has uh, asthma, an obstructive airway disease. So yes, then lung function is normal, but the curve is also a message for, for, for us performing the spirometry, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I cannot see any more questions. Okay, I think there's mm -hmm. one more right now. Okay. Well, so- it's, um, I think there's Michelle, a hand up. Uh, Okay, she says, at what age is it advisable to move the child with asthma to the adult clinic? Is 16 years too early? <laughs> I like to hold on to their children. I, you know, pediatricians, they are very possessive. So when <laughs> I, I feel like up to age 18 is when I want to say goodbye to them. Because, and, and you see, transition is a process. 
transition is not an event. So when they become adolescents, you need to begin to prime them. So what I do is that I invite the adult doctor to come to our clinic and meet the adolescents from time to time. We have meetings and then we sort of reassure them that, look, where you are going there is just to continue what we are doing for you. And, and, and I must say, Dr. Divine is, is so super when it comes to that. So we've, we have sessions, we have several meetings, the parents can ask questions, the adolescents can also ask questions. And then sometimes we even are like a shared case where we sort of make it an overlap before a final transition. Mm -hmm. But like when they finish senior high school and they are entering the university, mm -hmm. then we can't hold on to them anymore. But Pediatricians, we are very possessive. So please allow us, don't, don't put pressure on us. We want to be sure that we, we, we've, we've done our jobs well. So usually like around between 16 and 18, we are preparing to move. After 18, we move. Okay, so please be patient for us parents. It, it, it's not our fault. It's just that we are we are possessive. So that one, that is our like our fault. We our weakness, but please understand us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Yes. So I think there are no more questions here. It's 643. Um, over to you, Fiona. Okay. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Samira. And Dr. Sandra, thank you so much for the amazing delivery. We've learned so much. I personally I've learned a lot I'm like wow there's so much involved in the topic asthma and even with the pumps I just knew one time but I've learned a lot and we are so grateful for your time once again God bless you and to all our audience we do not take your presence for granted without you there would be no discussion there would be no parents roundtable discussion and we just thank you all so much so I'd like to remind you of our next meeting, which will take place um, next month, August, um, the third Saturday of next month. That will be 19th August. So please make sure to save the dates and join us for another insightful discussion. So we would be bringing our meeting to a close. We'll be bringing our meeting to a close at this juncture. And please do enjoy the rest of your evening. And please do not forget to contact Missions Pediatrics. The number is in the chat box and on our flyers. If you had our flyer, you would see the number there. So you'd could, you could contact Mission Pediatrics for professional advice. And then um, for those who do not know, Dr. Samira is also a pediatrician at Mission Pediatrics. And they are, we are at your service. We are at your service. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Bye, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Bye.